Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ because there's no other way. Grateful, so very grateful. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue studying your word together. I just ask that you would seal to our hearts that which is truth, filter out any foolishness, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in John. Just to quickly review some of the things that I've seen in the past uh, several studies. John, when confronted by the Jews concerning his baptism, he replied by quoting Scripture. The Jews should have understood. John did not exalt himself. The Jews seemed to value only John's credentials. Christ's baptism was his being ordained into the priesthood. Uh, it appears that the Messiah is entering uh, into his ministry where Israel entered the promised land. Uh, the baptism in the epistles is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not water. The Jews would not have ordained Jesus Christ to the priesthood. The text clearly states that they do not know him. Jesus spent very little time in Jerusalem. John makes it absolutely clear he's not worthy to be Christ's slave. And in that, I told you, I, I believe I see total depravity. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, not the Lion of God. The Jews were expecting a reigning monarch, not a suffering Savior. They should have understood Abraham and Isaac. And I pointed out the fact that Abraham and Isaac left their servants and went on alone. Was, this was something that they had to do themselves. No synergism in our new birth. And that how that Christ removed Adam's transgression for all men. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And John's message of grace and truth was proclaimed outside, not within, but outside the ecclesiastical system. So in our last study together, we had just started the paragraph at verse 29 of chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which is taking away the sin of the world. And I pointed out to you that in the Greek, the genitive, uh, both are, are articulated. The Lamb of the God. But that's the simple English possessive. This is the genitive possession here. The start statement that the Jews heard was behold God's lamb and you have every right to translate it that way and immediately the Jews who were experts in the scriptures they should have had their minds snapped to the picture of Abraham offering Isaac typifying a suffering savior not a reigning king his, his first advent not the second advent and all of Israel went out to John to be baptized and the word all there I believe that uh, is all of God's people uh, certainly you can't read that and say that every single you know the city was evacuated so they all went out to John to be baptized and there were some he baptized and some that he he didn't when the leaders the experts the the theological wisdom of the day came out to John he did not he told him he wasn't going to baptize him he wouldn't baptize him go back bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and then come back and I'll baptize you so John was well known he was well known to the people and he was well known to the theological experts and he declares this is God's lamb and those who, who knew the Scriptures, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the theological experts, those who understood God's Word, who knew God's Word better than, than you or I do, 
their jaws should have dropped over the statement, Behold God's Lamb. Because this is what all of the sacrifices of the law are, po are pointing to. Taking away the sin of the world, and I have to believe the world here is the field in which both wheat and tare were sown. I shared a little bit of this, somewhat of that, to Facebook. That what was taken away or removed was Adam's transgression, all men. I've explained that uh, somewhat in previous videos. So I'll, I'll briefly cover that again, but first you'll remember in Matthew 13 that there was good seed planted. That's what God did. He planted good seed. We then read that while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tare. And when the servants found out that there was tare in the field, they came to the master and they said, you didn't sow good seed. And he said, I did sow good seed. And as far as the tare is, was concerned, he says, I didn't do this. And people seem to miss that in Matthew 11. I didn't do it. I didn't sow the tare. So Satan sowed the tare, folks, not our Lord. God's system, the world, the field, had tare sowed in it. But the field was the world, not the seed. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that the disciples wanted to know what that parable meant. He's, he's very precise. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. It seems like he's pretty specific, very clear on what he's on how he interprets that parable. He doesn't leave any question open as to what is what. And when he interprets that parable, he didn't say the seed was the world. He didn't say that tear was the good seed. There was good seed and there was tear. And I believe the world system that God is talking about is his field. And in that field are his elect. And I understand God's people strain at that. You know, I'm sure that you can read a thousand commentaries. And they'll all agree that the world here means every living creature. And I find that interesting. Because I believe they're correct to say that. Christ's death, his death on the cross, removed Adam's transgression as it concerned all men, but that does not in any way infer that tear becomes wheat, which is what modern Christianity believes. Nothing any evangelist can do can change tear into wheat. I believe that this is primarily a passage that deals with God's people and the removal of Adam's transgression in the sense of universal removement of his transgression for all men. The scriptures clearly point out that we all sinned in Adam, for by one man sin entered the world in that system that God has designed for all men, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men for all sin. And it's amazing to me how many Christians will argue with me how God has no right to do that? I, I am never going to stand up in front of God and say, you don't have any right to do what you did. I think with, with confidence I can say, God, you have no right to condemn me because Jesus Christ died in my place. But for anyone to foolishly suggest that God cannot declare that all sinned when Adam sinned is naive. Adam was the proper representation of the human race. And listen to me, folks. If that isn't true, if that isn't true, then you're not redeemed in Jesus Christ. Folks, if Adam cannot represent this race, represent all people in time, Christ cannot represent the second Adam. He can't represent... Please, please get that point. If we didn't all sin in Adam, we're not all made alive in Christ. God said that there was a universal condemnation as a result of Adam's sin, 
And as a result of that, there was a universal justification in God's Lamb who took away the sin of the world. We know there are those who believe in limited in atonement and unlimited atonement. And, and, and they can throw Scripture back and forth. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. That's not the way you handle the Word of God. You don't take one verse of Scripture and build your theology on it. It isn't a, a private interpretation. The Holy Spirit is not telling you that you can't take a verse of Scripture and make a private interpretation of the verse. The Holy Spirit is saying you can't use one verse of Scripture by itself. It doesn't stand alone. It has to be in harmony with all the rest of the Word of God. Don't pull out some little notebook in, uh, it's in your, from your, that you carry around in your pocket and say, you know, I, I pulled out all the verses of Scripture that support my theology as if that's your Bible. You can't do that. That is handling the Word of God deceitfully. If you want to sit down and, and amass a bunch of Scriptures that support unlimited atonement, you can do that. If you want to amass a group of Scriptures that support limited atonement, you can do that too. And so now we have Arminians and we have Calvinists. Oh, Steve, so you know, you're a Calvinist. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not of Calvin. I'm not of Paul or Cephas. I mean, it, in fact, Calvin was, you could say Calvin was a Sewellist in some cases. There are cases where I agree with Calvin, but Calvin didn't come up with tulip in what's called Calvinism today encompasses some of what he taught. It doesn't encompass some of the other things that Calvin taught, but basically those are the two camps that have evolved. There is no doubt that Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Listen to me. Now you've got to decide what you're going to do with the word world there. Because it's the sins of the whole world. And people immediately say, you know, uh-huh, you, you see that's people rather than looking at it as a system. There is an aspect in which Jesus Christ died for all men, and even the commentators know that, as well as they also know, or they should know, most of them do know, Romans chapter 5, that Adam's condemnation passed upon all men unto death, therefore justification of life passed upon all men through Jesus Christ. It isn't all males, it's all mankind, anthropos. So in the, in the sense that all mankind died in Adam, all mankind were made alive in Christ. So if somebody wants to stand before God and say, you have no right to say that I sinned in Adam, it really doesn't make any difference because the same God declared you alive in Christ. And, and folks, I have heard pastors say that when a baby is born and it cries, it cries because it's a sinner in Adam. Unbelievable. I, I'm almost speechless at that. I hardly know what to say, except I, I just think that the kid's just hungry. You know, it, it can't talk yet. It's not able to say, Mommy, I'd like something to eat. To suggest that is, is because it's a sinner in Adam is, to me, that's just plain foolishness. I believe that baby is born alive spiritually. That's why I believe all children go to heaven. But now the day comes when that baby sins. I don't know when that is. I do not believe it's the minute the baby comes out of the womb. And when that baby sins, when that child sins, which I believe is more near to an adult, he now dies a second time spiritually. He died spiritually in Adam. He was made spiritually alive in Christ. And then he died spiritually in his own sin. When the commandment came, sin revived, says Paul, and I died. I died. That's the second death. 
But now if we're made alive, the second birth, the new birth, then we're one of God's elect. If the person isn't made alive, he's part of the second death. And you, you all know the verses. You know, we'll put these together when we get to the third chapter. But I want to try to answer some of the questions that I've gotten this week. We have in Jude those who are spots in your feasts. They're twice dead. And you read the commentaries and you think, you know, boy, these people are really pushing around the point that they are twice dead because they're dead spiritually and they're dead physically. Now, now, last I checked, we don't, we don't really uh, get a whole lot of views here at Blessed Hope Forever. We don't have a whole lot of physically dead people following these studies or watching these videos. They're not physically dead, folks. They're still in your worship services. And some commentators, of course, realize, uh, oh, well, it couldn't be that. When it says that they're twice dead, it means they're really dead. And I read that and I think, wow, how can anybody say twice dead means really dead? Dead is dead. I didn't, I didn't know that there was a dead and then a very dead. You know, like that guy's dead, you know, but that other guy, well, he's really, really dead. I mean, that's also foolishness. Dead is dead. They are twice dead because they died in their own sin. They died once in Adam, and then they died in their own sin. And when you finally get to the book of Revelation, we see the second death because they weren't made alive a second time. If God had not removed Adam's transgression, it really doesn't matter what sins you commit. You're already condemned. And all children wind up in hell. And I've published a number of videos on that subject. And yet most of the literature that I read is devoid of any emphasis on the justification in, in Jesus Christ with respect to Adam's condemnation. And in a previous video, I, I believe I pointed out the sin that He takes away is singular, the entire sin nature. It's not sins, plural. And the new man cannot sin because it's born of God. It wouldn't bother me if you decided that the word world here meant God's elect and Israel alone, that it includes Israel and the Gentiles who are going to be grafted in. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, and you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither knows Him. The word sins there is plural. Sins. Here it is, He took away sin singular. The word take away here in the text means bear away, carry away, lift up. He takes away sin. It's a present tense. He takes away the sin of the world. And the present tense is, I believe, referencing a finished work with respect to Adam's transgression. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man. A man, okay? We're looking at the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ here, which is preferred before me, for He was before me. Now we're, now we're looking at the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss seeing that in, in one verse. In one verse, folks, we see both. We see His humanity, and we see the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In actual fact, John the Baptist is older than Jesus Christ from a human standpoint. And so we have both the humanity and the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized in this statement by John the Baptist. Did John really know who Jesus was? Well, Elizabeth and Mary were cousins. So John and, and Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus were second cousins. 
Of course he knew Jesus. You know, here, here's Mary and Joseph talking. You know, boy, wasn't that amazing that, the, that old Zach and Beth had a kid. You know, they were so old. You know, I, I didn't think that could happen. I mean, you're not going to go see that kid? I can't help but believe that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ played together as little kids. When was it John the Baptist had it revealed to him that Jesus Christ, his second cousin, was God in the flesh. That he and Christ were more than second cousins. We are looking at verse 31, and I knew him not. And he repeats that in verse 33. Now, when I see the Holy Spirit repeat himself, I have to take notice. Anytime that you see the Holy Spirit repeat Himself, you should stop and take notice. But that He should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw, that is beheld, perfect tense, the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon Him. Verse 33, And I knew Him not, But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. The word new in both verses 31 and 33 is oida to intellectually perceive, and it's, and it's in the pluperfect tense in the Greek. Now, there aren't many pluperfects in the New Testament. I've often discussed the, the perfect tense. There aren't many pluperfects. The Greek is beautifully, grammatically constructed to present vivid pictures in the Word. The perfect tense deals with an action that's totally complete in past time. In, when, in which we're looking at the present reality or the present result of that action that took place in past time. That's the perfect tense. The pluperfect, on the other hand, looks at the completed action in past time and so we could, if we wanted to, translate it, back then I absolutely did not know Him. And that's what the pluperfect is asking you to do. To look back to a time in which John did not know who the Lord Jesus Christ was. And yet John knew his cousin, Jesus of Nazareth. They were cousins, and I believe that the text is saying that John did not actually comprehend that his cousin, Jesus, of Nazareth was in fact the promised Messiah of biblical prophecy. The question in my mind here is when did he know that? Because he brought a record. He brought a testimony of that. And rather than try, blow a fuse upstairs trying to determine uh, whether or not John saw the dove descend in a vision or it was in his head or, or it happened for real, I'm more interested in looking at what he said here. I suggest that the dove being like a spirit is contrasted with his, his baptizing in water and that the dove, of, uh, the dove of peace is also you know, seen in Noah sending out a dove from the ark that didn't return because, well, why didn't it, why didn't it return? It, because it found dry land in a new world after God's judgment came upon the whole world. I'm not sure that a careful examination of the text is not revealing to us that John did not know who Jesus was until God revealed him to John, at which point, I don't know, he states he did not know him twice, and he announced Jesus as the Lamb of God before the baptism took place, well, he obviously knew who Jesus was when he said, Behold the Lamb of God. 
but this was before the baptism took place, which would confirm what he knew. The dove sign did not cause John to believe. It confirmed what he already believed. I want to say that once again, so you might, those of you who are interested, you want to take the time to ponder that and meditate on that. It has great significance. The dove was a sign, but that sign did not cause John to believe. It confirmed what he already believed. Verse 35 and 36. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Now there's a couple of things I want you to look at in verses 35, 36, and 37. Now, folks, I don't want to build more out of this than I should. And in many past videos, I've really gone heavy off into that direction. I had to kind of had kind of had to rein myself in here with this verse by verse stuff. But the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, the word stood is pluperfect again, a grammatical construction that's rare in the New Testament. I believe that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to us that it's not John's activity, but what John said. It's the word that he spoke. And it was the word of God. Most of what I see in the ecclesiastical world today is activity. Okay? We've got a program that attracts. In the following verses, we're going to see four different individuals come to Christ. John, all he did was declare, Behold the Lamb of God. That's just four simple words, or five. Behold God's Lamb. If, if Maybe it's three words. What John said was so simple. Behold God's Lamb. And yet, the power of those three words we see in the text, at least I'm, I'm going to suggest that what we see in the text, which will follow in my next video, we'll, we'll see something quite extraordinary that took place just by him saying those three words. So John stood. I want you to see more in the word stood than just, well, I, like I stood out in, in the pasture and calling to the horse. Right? Now, the two who stood with John the Baptist, one being Andrew, they were obviously John the Baptist's disciples. They were followers of John the Baptist. And I think what the Holy Spirit wants us to see in this is that it isn't any program that John had. He just stood. The text says standing, pluperfect tense. The word means he stood firm. And the grammar asks us to look back to the point where he stood firm. He's not trying to build a following. What he says, in fact, costs him disciples. Now, I find that intriguing. You folks out there, you don't follow me. You follow Christ. We want a growing church. If it isn't growing, it's not spiritual. Or is it? That's the, that's the modern consensus. We have John the Baptist proclaiming the Word of God. That's all he did, and he lost two followers. He said, Behold God's Lamb, and they turned and they followed Jesus. We know that Andrew went and found his brother, Simon, and then we have one last one, and that's Philip. Now, let's, just, let's quickly look at these. Two of these guys came to Christ. Two of these guys came to Christ. Two of these people came to Christ because of the truth spoken by John. One of these came to Christ because his brother went and found him and brought him to Christ. In the fourth one, nobody found him. Christ Jesus sought out Philip. Now, 
there's three or four different situations there. People are introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ by the proclamation of the Word. Others, by hearing the Word through those who are associated with them, close to them, or, or interested in them as, as Andrew and Simon. And others come to Christ because the Holy Spirit reaches them independent of any other testimony. And I find that intriguing. There's something of further interest here, and I'm jumping ahead because I want you to see this. The word Simon is, is an, uh, an interesting uh, Hebrew word that means hearing. And in the 42nd verse, we're told Simon, the son of Jonah, you can't argue with the fact that it's really Simon, the son of John, and the word John means a gift from God. So Simon means hearing. John means a gift from God. Therefore, we could say that the ability to hear is a gift from God. And I find that amazing. Look, I love you all. I truly do. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world that uh, I'm going to leave it to the other experts to talk about. I think the most important thing uh, in my life is that I focus in on, on the Word, not be distracted by so much that's going on in the world. It's not that I'm not watching. It's not that I'm not looking up. But we all have our, our calling. and, and uh, I, I just feel like that at the present time, this is what God would have me do. And so I'm doing that because I, I love God's Word. And, and so as a result, I share that with you. Once again, look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.